Alrighty, let's get started. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to another uh, Astro 3D ECR Astronomers in Australia seminar series. My name is Dr. Amelia Fraser McKelvey. I'm a postdoc at the University of Western Australia, uh, which is part of the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. My co chair today is Dr. Jeffrey Simpson, who is a postdoc at the University of New South Wales. Now, before we begin today, it's important for us to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting. So the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were Australia's first astronomers, and we acknowledge their long-standing systems of knowledge on which we continue to build. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the unceded lands on which we are meeting today. Myself and our two speakers today are joining you from the land of the Wajak Noongar people, and my co-chair Jeffrey is joining us from the land of the Watamatagal clan of the Darug Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all First Peoples joining us here today. So why are we here? This series is facilitated by Astro 3D, which is the ARC Centre of Excellence for all sky astrophysics in three dimensions. Basically COVID-19 has affected our ability to travel and present at international seminars. And for us here in Australia, um, it's quite difficult because the time zones mean that often meetings take place at 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning for us. So this lack of opportunity to network could disadvantage junior astronomers uh, when they're going to enter the job market. So this series aims to combat these issues by providing them a platform uh, to present their work to the world. So we've got two talks this hour. Each talk will be 20 minutes in length with five minutes for questions at the end of each talk. So please save your questions until the end and you can either pop them in the chat function or just raise your hand. Uh, these talks are also being recorded and they're going to be placed afterwards on the Astro 3D YouTube channel. Uh, so by being here today, you're agreeing to abide by Astro 3D's meeting code of conduct. So let's move on to our first talk. Our first speaker today is Dr. Garima Chauhan, who has just finished her PhD at uh, also ICRA at the University of Western Australia. So Garima is going to be talking to us about the connection between atomic hydrogen, galaxies and dark matter and galaxy formation simulations. So Garima, the screen is yours. Uh, thanks a lot, Amelia. I would start sharing my screen in a second. Can everybody see it? Uh, yes, perfect. Great. So um, thanks for the introduction, Amelia. I am, hi, I'm Garima, and today I'll be talking about the connection between atomic hydrogen galaxies and dark matter, uh, dark matter in galaxy formation simulations with the focus of this talk being the H1 halo mass scaling relation, what are the physical processes that might be affecting it, and how are different observation strategies resulting in different inferred H1 HM relations that we see. Oh yeah, I lovingly called H1 halo mass scaling relation as H1 HM relation, just for people. Um, so moving forward, why scaling relations? Now scaling relations are fundamental in our un enhancing our understanding of the galaxy properties and the way they change or are resulting in galaxy formation and evolution. One of the most fundamental scaling relation that we are all aware of is the stellar mass halo mass scaling relation, as you can see from this plot over here. Now, this scaling relation is particularly a very tight relation. No matter how you are observing it or measuring it, it still remains within a certain small amount of dispersion. So it's kind of a tight relation. Now, this relation is used by simulations to test the robustness of their prescriptions and how well the simulation is performing. Thus, it is fundamental in a way that it, first of all, tests out if our simulations are correct and how well we are reproducing the scaling relation, test the robustness of it as well. So why are we moving from stellar mass, halo mass scaling relation to the H1-HM relation? Well, from this nice barren budget diagram that you can see over here, stars comprise of only 7% of the total barren budget, as we can see over here. So it becomes imperative for us to venture into other baryons or other scaling relations in order to understand the physical processes that go behind galaxy formation and evolution. And Hachman becomes a really good candidate in this way that it's, first of all, pretty abundant. Second, is very much affected by the physical processes that are going on. And thirdly, with the new radio telescopes that are coming up, it is one of, it will be observed at an unprecedented level. So we would be able to understand a lot more about the physical processes if we know how the H1 halo scaling, H1 halo mass scaling relation or H1 HM relation is changing or is being inferred. So just to give a 
idea or brief preview on how different the stellar mass halo mass scaling relation is from the H1 halo mass scaling relation. Over here, I'm showing the H1 mass of alpha alpha galaxies and comparing them to the velocity width of the emission lines. Now, the velocity width of these emission lines are kind of closely related to dark matter masses as well. So they could be used as analogous. But one thing that actually jumps out is the scatter. As compared to the stellar mass halo mass relation, which had a scatter of say 0.2 dex maximum, we find a scatter of two dex, which is pretty hard, more than two dex actually, which shows that H1 halo mass scaling relation has a huge scatter. Now the physics lies in the scatter of the things, hence this becomes a very interesting topic for us to understand because this would tell us about all the other physical properties that are going on or processes that are going on inside these galaxies. So how do we go about tackling it? As it was in my title, Galaxy Formation Simulations, I use semiotic simulation for my analyses, in particular, shark semiotic simulations. Now, SAMs, in a nutshell, use dark matter-only simulation as their base, trace back the merger histories of the galaxies, uh, of the halos, and then populate these halos with baryons using various numerical schemes. In my analyses, I use surfs and body simulation, and we use two different resolutions, a smaller volume box, but a high resolution and a medium resolution, larger volume box. So that it gives us a range of the halo masses. And we can go down to 10 to the seven particle masses as well, uh, solar masses and particle masses as well. We track down the merger history and the halo formation using tree frog and velociraptor. And finally, we populate these halos using various numerical schemes of baron physics that are implemented why a shark, the semiotic model that I'll be using for this analysis. Now, we have our galaxies ready. We have our H1 ready. The next step for us is to see how well we are doing when we compare it with observations. So in the plot on the left over here, the red line shows the H1 halo mass scaling relation that we get from shark, the total H1 and HM. And below here is the central and the satellite contributions. The maroon points over here are the observed H1-HM relation that we get from H1 stacking and H1 clustering. And the same things for the observations as well. One thing that jumps out over here is that we are agreeing pretty well with the H1 stacking results till 10 to the 12, after which we start diverging, which is something that is caused by systematics and other effects, which I will be discussing a bit later on in the talk. But one other thing to note is also that unlike stellar mass halo mass relation where no matter what technique we used we were still close to the resulting stellar mass halo mass relation in h1hm relation we find a tension this is indicative of the range of the h1hm relation that can take place from say from different various observations and could be many different things that could be causing this variation when you go to the simulation side of things what we find is that Every simulation has a very different H1 halo mass scaling relation. Now, all of these simulations have stood the test of the stellar mass halo mass relations. All of them give you a very reasonable stellar mass halo mass relation, but all of them use different physical prescriptions for different physical processes, which causes the varied shaped, uh, shapes in the H1 HM relation that we see over here. So, the first step that we wanted to see in order to understand the H1 HM relation was to see what physical processes causes the majority of this change that we see over here. And we found the culprit to be the AGN feedback. In the plot over here on the left, I'm showing how the AGN feedback going from no AGN feedback to the strongest AGN feedback affects the shape of the h one hm relation. So as we move from no feedback to strongest, the knee of the relation starts shifting towards lower, stellar ma uh, lower halo masses. Thus, it is very, very strongly affecting the shape of the relation. And it's not only the shape that it is actually making a difference too, it's also affecting the status a lot. So from the plot over here, it's a lot of things happening. So I will just take it step by step. The black solid line over here shows the median H1 mass of the halos, the dashed line, the central, and the dashed dot line, the satellite H1 mass contribution. The bins are colored according to the black hole to stellar mass ratio of the centrals of the galaxy. Uh, of the median galaxies that are in those halo mass bins. And what you can find is that as soon as you move into the regime where the agent feedback starts 
playing a role or starts becoming prominent, the scatter of the H1 agent relation flares up from say two decks to almost four decks in the region where the agent feedback plays a huge role. So the major reason behind the shape and the scatter of the, feed, of the H1 agent relation is the agent feedback. One other thing that we wanted to actually also see was that is this scatter constrainable, if that's the word, by only using halo properties, because what we wanted to do in the end was to come up with a numerical scheme or numerical model that can populate halos based on only dark matter properties or dark matter halo properties. Hence, it will be free from the physical processes because all the simulations use different variations of those. So we wanted to see if we could populate halos based on only dark matter properties. And in our analysis, analyses, we found that the spin parameter happens to be a really good property to constrain the scatter for the halo masses from till 10 to the 12, where higher the spin parameter, more the H1 mass of the halo and vice versa. For the halos with 10 to the 13 or greater masses, what we find is that the fraction mass of satellite to halo or to the host halo tends to be a good way to constrain the scatter in that region. And for the mass and for the region between 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13, a combination of those two happens to be a great way to measure them together. So using these three halo properties, we are able to come up with a numerical model that can populate halos from redshift zero to redshift two for any kind of simulation because all we need is halo masses and halo properties at this point. So now we have come up with the nice halo mass scaling relation and how we can make it or how we can populate these halos with it. And we find that it's a very complex relation. AGN is the culprit of most of the things and the scatter can be constrained by spin parameter and the halo mass. The next logical thing that we wanted to do was to see how well shock reproduces the current observation constraints because we can come up with a H1 halo mass scaling relation, but if we are not able to reproduce the observation, then it's a redundant process that we we're just getting something that might not be working in the end. So going back to the plot that I had shown before, where we, saw, where we saw the divergence between the uh, predicted h one hm relation from the chart to the observations, we thought of comparing apples to apples. For this comparison in here, in this plot, what we had done was we just took the h one masses or h one hm relation directly from the box. But in order to compare them with the observations, we also have to implement the same observational constraints that the surveys suffer through in our simulations. So the H1 stacking points over here are from Google's 2020 analyses in which they use the group catalog of SDSS and alpha alpha for the H1 stacking. So in order to make the apple to apple comparison, we make a mock survey, which is of the area of alpha alpha and goes down to redshift of 0.1. We put a magnitude limit of gamma because we wanted a deeper survey, as I will be explaining why in a bit. And we then run a fourth group finder on our mock survey. So now we have a mock survey ready with observation constraints and a group catalog to deal with and to understand how we can do H1 stacking. Currently, there are two very prevalent H1 stacking techniques that are around. The one that was used by Google 2020 is what we lovingly call the group stacking method, because why not? In group stacking, as from this diagram, as you can see over here, what they do is that they put the entire group within the aperture of the telescope, and then they stack all the galaxies, all the signals that are within a velocity window or a fixed velocity window. And by stacking all of them together, whatever H1 mass is out of it is associated to that group. We use the very same method that was used by Google 2020 in our mock survey. And then we find what H1H in relation we can infer out of it. So the 700, and what we can see from here is that the black line points are the observations with the green and the orange points are our analyses or our mock stacking. We 700 kilometer per second window is what was used by Google 2020 in their paper. And we just try to tweak it a little bit to see what happens if we change the velocity windows width slightly. And what we can see is that we can reproduce the H1HM relation or the inferred H1HM relation pretty well when we use the observation constraints and the methods used by the employed by the surveyors or the people who did the measurements. The other stacking technique that I will be talking about is the individual stacking technique 
which is used by Ree et al. in their upcoming paper, which use the group catalog of gamma, that's R by 19.5, and they use Dingo for the H1 stacking. The main difference between the group stacking and individual stacking is that the individual stacking relies on the optical survey to identify the galaxies that belong to a certain group, individually stack them together, and then sum up the H1 mass, and then associate that to the group that the galaxies belong to. We do the exact same procedure again, individually stack our groups and the galaxies in it, and to see how well we can reproduce the observations. And as you can see from the plot over here, we are again close to the observations when we are employing the techniques that are used by them. One thing that jumps out though, is that no matter how much tweaking changes to the velocity width, or maybe changing the way we are observing or doing the techniques, we are not able to recover the intrinsic h one hm relation that is lying behind the mass or the that is of the simulation, which is what our main goal is, because we know for sure that our mock simulation has this intrinsic shape. So there has to be a way that we could recover it. So we wanted to know or find why we can't recover this shape, no matter what we do for the observation techniques. So there could be three possible reasons for this discrepancy or departure from the shape. First, Maybe it's the group finding. Maybe we're not able to find the groups. Maybe they are being tagged differently than they're supposed to be. Secondly, maybe it's the halo mass estimates. Maybe we are not estimating the halo masses of the groups really well. And finally, contamination. Maybe there is a wayward galaxy that just wants to be part of the group and is being summed up in the hatred masses because it wants to belong there. So in order to understand these, we take a step-by-step -step approach. First, we focus on the group finding. In order to understand what is happening or how well are we recovering the groups, what we do is that we take all the galaxies that are flagged as centrals by the group finder and then track them back down to the simulation. Then we sum up all the H1 masses that is around that central within one viral radii to two viral radii of that host halo that the central or that galaxy belongs to. What we find is that as we there is a change or difference in the H1 mass that is measured if we change the aperture slightly, but the shape remains. So we're able to recover the shape. So it's not the group finding that is actually changing the shape of the H1-H1 relation, but something else. So next stop. Left. Thank you. Next stop is the halo mass measurement effect. Now the halo masses are measured in different ways. It's either by abundance matching, where you look at the luminosity halo mass relation and then infer the halo masses of the groups or luminosity of the groups. And second is dynamical method, in which you use the velocity dispersion and the radius of the fourth groups in order to estimate the halo mass. And as soon as we do that, we find the departure from the shape. The same exercise has been done, but in this case, we only use the masses measured by the methods or the abundance matching and dynamical masses, uh, dynamical method. And what we find is that there is a departure from the shape and the shape is lost. So the halo mass measurement tends to be the main culprit behind the departure from the shape. So next thing that we try to see is how well are we recovering the halo masses. Now on the left over here, this is the halo mass by abundance matching compared to the actual halo masses for those halos or for those galaxy groups and from dynamical masses and again to those galaxy group halo masses. What we find is that even though they're both close to the one is to one relation, there is huge scatter, which is the cause behind the departure from the shape that we see, or that is the reason why we cannot see the shape because it's washed out by the, all the scatter that is around. And this is actually the major cause as to why we see different inferred relations as well, because both these surveys, SDSS has relied on the abundance matching for their value for their halo mass estimates, and gamma has relied on dynamical mass to have their halo mass estimates, hence the different values that we get. Finally, contamination. Do we have any wayward galaxies that just want to be part of the group? In order to see how big of an effect the contaminations are having, we measure it in this way. So the line, red line over here is the intrinsic H1 mass, a H1 halo mass relation that we get from our light cone, which contains all the halos that have at least five or more SDSS gamma detectable galaxies in it, and the actual halo mass and the H1 mass of those galaxy of, of those halos. Second is the observations from Google. 2020 paper where they are looking at galaxy groups which have five or more galaxies in it and the H1 mass associated to it. Then we have the best match halos. Now these best match halos are the best match counterparts of the galaxy groups in our mock catalog 
with the intrinsic halos in our simulation group, uh, in our simulation box. And then just to see how much of the H1 mass they have, because these will be comparable to the resulting mock scat tad like, because these are the closest to the groups that we see. And this is the mock H1 stacking results of those groups which we find over here. And as you can see from the plot over here, the mock stacking technique or the mock H1, H low relation that we get is departing from the best match halos. And thus we can see signs of contamination coming up right away. We do the same exercise with the individual stacking technique. And what we find is that the contamination is that it's minimal, which is to be expected because we are using smaller aperture windows and with looking at individual galaxies and not the whole thing in one go. But one thing that also see is there is that we are losing a lot of H1 mass as we go towards higher halo masses. Just to see how big of a difference it will be if we go to a deeper spectroscopic survey, we just make a small variation to it and we use waves as our magnitude limit, which is two magnitudes deeper than gamma. And we find a significant improvement and recovery of the H1 mass in the halos but still not as much as near the intrinsic. So what we find is that group finding has, oh, sorry, group stacking has a bigger velocity window, which causes contamination and does a departure from the shape. Could be a good upper limit on the H1 halo mass that we see. And the individual stacking, which doesn't suffer through contamination, but is limited by the op uh, optical survey that it's relying on, can be a good lower limit on the H1 mass that could be in the group. So in conclusion, the H1 halo mass scaling relation is complex, non-monotonic, and has a large scatter, which is caused by the agent feedback. Um, it, it can be constrained using spin parameter and the fraction of mass of satellites. Predicted H1 HM scaling relation is the combination of group finding, halo mass estimation, and contamination of the galaxies that are not part of the group. And finally, different H1 stacking techniques provide different limits with group stacking providing an upper limit to the average H1 halo scaling relation, whereas individual stacking providing a lower limit. And that should be all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karima. Great talk. So I'll hand across to Jeffrey for question time. Okay. Do we have any questions? Feel free to raise your hand or use the chat function to write out the question. I will ask a, a Dumb, quite silly, quite stupid question. So, so because this is not at all the sort of thing I do. Um, are there? Um, can the observations be improved to make the halo masses better? Um, yes, in a way. Uh, so the dynamical mass method tends to be better. Um, so from what we are looking at, what we find is that if we go to waves, which is a deeper spectroscopic service, it will be looking at more galaxies. The dynamical mass estimates would actually be better at constraining the halo masses. Um, but I don't know, I mean, I do not envy the halo masses or the way the halo masses to be estimated because it is a very, very tricky process and we don't know for sure what you've seen is right or not any base. So it is a very complex way, but the only way I can see is having deeper spectroscopic survey because group finding all in all tends to be giving somewhat or the other pretty okay-ish results. Yeah, the, the plots of, um... The, the giant scatter of um, what you thought it should be, what you observed was scary. <laughs> yeah, it is a bit scary, but that this is just an observation that you're finding. Um, it all really, really depends on how it's being measured. Uh, anyone got another question? Um, I suppose I can ask one again, also very much not my field of expertise, Karima, but uh, Mention the spin parameter. Could you pop back to that plot? Oh, yeah, sure. Quickly. Yeah. It's so much far away. Yeah, sorry. Yep, yeah, there it is. Yeah, I'm just I'm just kind of interested in why. So the spin parameter, I guess, is it the same as it's defined in observation? So sort of the ratio of um, uh, rotation support to dispersion support within a galaxy? Yes. Yeah, so the spin parameter over here is actually the halo spin parameter. So it will be the one that is intrinsic to the halo that will be computed by the dark matter simulations and the way it is there. I see. Um, because our okay. main aim was to come up with a numerical model that can populate halos based on only dark matter properties. 
because as all the physical or the hydrodynamical simulations and the semiotic simulations use so many different physical prescriptions for these things, we wanted to be sure that something that is not reliant on those, but something that's more inherent to the simulation would be a better idea to come up with the value. So this is the dark matters, uh, the halo spin parameter. Right, so here comes the obvious but also stupid question. Is there an observational equivalent of, of this sort of measurement? Um, I would say that at least for this part, um, this should be kind of a bit close to the central spin parameter because till 10 to the 12, you hardly see satellites contributing at all. So if you see for smaller halos, or I think central spin parameter should be a good equivalent to it. There will be some deviations, yes, but um, more or less it should be a good way to, good, we'll give a good handle on it. Right, and that's where you see the this correlation, isn't it? So when you start bringing in your satellites, you sort of lose any sort of correlation yeah. with this lambda value. Yeah, interesting. Okay, thanks. No worries. I'll ask another question that I should know the answer to, but what is the Milky Way? Where's the Milky Way sit on this? What's the oh, very what? mess? What's the very um, mess of the Milky Way? I think it's ten to the thirteen. Okay, I was just wondering if it was like twelve, and it was like really interestingly just at the knee, and it's like one of those like everything happens, the Milky Way or the Sun happen to be just like perfectly in the right place, but no. Yeah, I think it's only. I think it's around twelve points. It's out definitely greater than twelve. I think we just did it recently. Went on this rabbit hole trying to find out what exactly the mass was. I think it's more than twelve point five. Okay. Okay, I don't see any other questions, so we can move on. Amelia. Yes, I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Lily, yeah, let's thank Arima again for a nice clear talk. Thank you.